Atheist Nomads, episode 130, news for January 21, 2016. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Uh, Lauren is not with us. She's got some intestinal cramps going on right now that she's been dealing with for several months. It's it's getting quite annoying. Oh, shit. Yeah. And she was fine most of the day until about an hour before we were we were supposed to start recording, and then it just hit really hard. Oh man! Better buy her her own bucket. <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah, and I guess that's adding insult to injury. Uh, last week, her temporary job that she's had for the last. Oh, seven months came to an unexpected end. Very abrupt, unexpected end. Uh, so we are now uh, down a paycheck. Shit. So I'm drinking PBR. <laughs> oh, no. Listeners, Dude. you can help out by supporting us on Patreon or PayPal. <laughs> Please. Don't don't let him drink PBR. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I was also sick for about two weeks. Uh, finally, at almost the two-week mark, because that what was really annoying was I started getting better, and then I started getting worse. And so I went into urgent care last week, and I got on some antibiotics, and now I'm better. So, yay! Hurry for science. <laughs> yay for zithromycin. Yeah. I don't know if I can take that. Anyways. It was crazy with that one. It was $15 with insurance for six pills. Okay. Insurance knocked off $45. Oh, okay. So those pills are almost $10 each. But if you have an upper respiratory infection or pneumonia, it's the stuff for the job. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and move into dusting off the degree. Ooh. Uh, Pew did a survey last year on racial diversity among U.S. religious groups, and I became aware of this as a result of several of my Adventist friends on Facebook being very excited. According to the survey, Adventists, Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Buddhists are the most diverse with Adventists at the top. And the National Baptist Convention, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, African Methodist Episcopal Church, United Methodist Church, and Hinduism among the least diverse. And by least diverse, I mean 90% or more being all part of one ethnic group. In the case of the Lutherans and mainline Methodists, that's more than 90%, actually more than 94% white in the case of the National Baptist Convention and African Methodist Episcopal Church, more than 94% black. And in the case of Hinduism, more than 90% Asian. So not too terribly surprising on those. Uh, with U.S. Adventists, 37% are white, 32% black, 15% Latino, 8% Asian, and 8% are of a mixed race or other. So they must be doing everything well, right? <laughs> well, the Adventist church structure has the general conference at the top, which is then divided into 13 divisions with the U S and Canada making up one of those divisions. Uh, that's the, the North American division with roughly 1 million members out of the more than 18 million worldwide. And the North American division by far holds the most power within the church, despite being a little more than 5% of the total church membership. 
they also produce most of the money. Uh, Canada has one union conference, and the U.S. is divided into several others. Each union is then made up of conferences that are that roughly equate to states, at least within the white church. The black church across the U.S., with the exception of the West, has regions that are equivalent to conferences and sometimes called conferences, but they cover the black churches within that union. This was set up to make sure that the black churches reported to conference officials they could better relate to and give them a greater voice in the church structure. And it has made it so that black pastors have an easier time rising through the church ranks, even though this isn't particularly common. Uh, On one occasion, a black man actually did make it to North American Division president, uh, but that's the only time, only once. And again, with the exception of the Western U.S., there are four to six white conferences per union and one to three black regions per union. Additionally, there are Spanish-speaking churches for Latinos and various Asian and Pacific Island churches for the different countries people have immigrated from. Uh, Like if you look in Portland, there will be a Filipino Adventist church and a Korean Adventist church and a Vietnamese Adventist church. Uh, Medford, Oregon actually has a Samoan Adventist church. And in the West, pretty much every city has a Anglo church, the white church, and Latino church that is in, in Spanish. And what's been an interesting trend recently is that despite the fact that these other minority churches are supposed to be under the white church structure, you know, the, the official normal structure, uh, there's been a trend for them to transfer over to the black regions. At least when they're able to, because they have found that they have greater autonomy and more voice with black leadership. So it really is a separate, but definitely not equal structure. It's a segregated church with almost exclusively white men overseeing the black regional leadership and considering the near even numbers between black and white Adventists, the ratios of conferences to regions doesn't equate. And this is all to the advantage of the white churches. Uh, I was looking into the difference in numbers between conferences and regions. It's five to six uh, white or four to six white conferences, one to three black regions. The deep south is the area with three black regions, but there's still more white conferences there. Even though I would assume, considering how many Adventists there are in the western U.S., uh, there's a lot more black Adventists in that region, that that territory. And so, but there, there's also the aspect that American Adventists used to be pretty much all white. Where'd the white people go? Diversity is a wonderful thing, but when you're dealing with a large organization that should be appealing to people at large, you would expect or hope that the demographics would roughly match the country as a whole. That breakdown is 66% white, 12% black, 15% Latino, and 8% for everybody else. Methodists and Lutherans obviously have problems with their memberships being well over 90% white. And the specifically black denominations, uh, I I wouldn't say they're doing anything wrong because they aren't trying to reach white people. They are black churches for black people. Methodists and Lutherans are not white churches for white people. They are just churches for people who just happen to all be white. And I would also think that if your group, again, your group that is specifically targeting, well, not specifically targeting any one group, but if it's doing very well with traditionally economically disenfranchised groups, traditionally poorly educated groups, and these would be blacks and immigrants, but they're not doing very well with privileged groups, especially in the case of Adventists, the ones that you push to get educations, there's definitely something missing. Do you have anything to add? 
Not really. I mean, it just sounds kind of like a, <clears throat> a fucked up system. You know, like they really just stack the deck. It's there was a, a saying I, I heard over and over in college, or not a saying, a statistic that half of us wouldn't return to an Adventist church after graduation. I was a little bit later than that. I didn't return to an Adventist church other than for weddings and funerals after I dropped out of the seminary. So I made it an extra year past graduating. But from what I've seen, at least among white Adventists, it's way over 50% leaving sometime in their early 20s, early to mid-20s. And I think it has to do with the strong push for education among white Adventists. Education has a, a very strong correlation with not being religious. And especially when you're pushing a very conservative message, that doesn't stack up well with people who are taught how to think. Yes, Adventists do have some black colleges. Well, has a black college. And there is, as far as I know, one other Adventist college that is predominantly black. All the rest are mostly white. And so they, the, the education push definitely isn't making it to the, the minority groups like it is to the white Adventist kids. And yeah, they're, they're not going to stop growing because they are doing very well in the developing world. They're holding their numbers in the U.S. unlike everybody else. But they're definitely in trouble. If nothing else, they're going to be losing all their money. <laughs> well, we've talked about that in the past that, you know, they, they keep on losing numbers from a variety of, of sources. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're just hemorrhaging from just yet another one. Hemorrhaging white people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there, there's a difference there. <laughs> yeah. Uh because they aren't uh, hemorrhaging anybody else. They're not having any trouble holding on to minorities and holding on to uh, or attracting people in the developing world. Yeah, but I think most religions are that way. They e they can easily attract people in third worlds or you know, non-American countries. And also with disenfranchised groups within the US. Mm. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh the black and Hispanic communities in particular are churches very, very important as part of their culture. Yeah, sure. And that definitely adds some holding power. All right, let's take a commercial break and then we will be back with this day in history. No. Okay. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash atheist nomads. All right, so this day in history, January 21st, starting with 1738, the great Ethan Allen was born. Mm, yeah, so the maker of uh, unfinished, kind of shitty furniture and the great <laughs> American general was born. Hooray. Yay. That's really all I'm putting into that. <laughs> oh, boy. I hate it. I hate those stores. Anyway, <laughs> why, in the, why in the fuck would anybody have a store where you have to finish your own furniture? Yeah. Ikea? Yeah, but Ikea is cheap. Ethan Allen isn't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this day in history, 1954, the first nuclear powered submarine, the USS Nautilus, is launched in Groton, Connecticut by Mamie Eisenhower, the first lady of the United States. Yeah, man, she was a sexy one, I'll tell you what. <laughs> uh, <Mamie>. Anyway, <laughs> hey, come on, Mamie. 
Yeah. Not as bad as Lady Bird. Oh, oh God. Who who was that? Johnson. That, oh God. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the Nautilus. Uh first uh nuke powered sub. Kind of cool. It was actually uh, uh duly named after uh Jules Verne's uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea ship and uh, the SS Nautilus uh, SS 168, which uh, served during World War II. Uh, yeah, it was uh, authorized in 51, launched in 54. And, uh, you know, because it was a nuke, I mean, it was able to do a lot of things that uh, the, the conventional diesel power boats just couldn't do, like fucking go under the North Pole under the ice. Or you know, <laughs> travel to distant islands that, or lands in in a single swoop without uh, you know needing fuel for one or really coming up for air. It could stay under for a lot longer period of time. Yeah, um, yeah. The so, engine doesn't require oxygen. Yeah, <laughs> that's huge. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I think the diesel boats, diesel submarines, could stay down for. You know, a matter of like a couple days, maybe. But you know, a, a nuke-powered sub with good oxygen o- oxygen scrubbers can stay down for months. If it wasn't for people needing to eat, it could be years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> turn into mole people or some shit in the dark. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways, yeah. So uh, sadly, it was decommissioned in 1980. But you know, that's actually a hell of a run for something like that. Uh, Especially something that was effectively a prototype. Yeah, totally. Uh, so it, it's actually a, a little museum, and you know, I'd bring sneak on a Geiger counter because I'm betting that shit's still glowing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, that, that's a it's a hell of a piece of history. Uh, you know, it definitely wasn't just a, a a peaceful boat. It did have six torpedo tubes, and you know. I don't think it was ever used for a war of any sort, but you know, yeah, it was there. It was ready. Always. Totally willing. Man, we've been scrapping some really cool boats lately. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. A, a little one was called, it's a little, um, a little tiny thing, like a, a three or four person sub that's made to go like super deep mm. and, or like mount onto, like sunken submarines and rescue people. It's called the NR one. We're just oh, going nice. to scrap that one. It's huh. really kind of sad. Cause I don't think we really have any more of those. Anything huh. like that. Yeah. When I was in Britain, I got to tour a British sub. I think it was the first British sub for sure. It might've been the first submarine period. It's from like 1900. Mm. I hit my head so many times in that little <laughs> thing. Yeah, that shit's no joke. Oh, man. It was made for tiny people who would be bending over. Yeah. I mean, if you go back 20 years, submarines, I mean, even surface ships, I mean, all of their, you know, everything up in the in the headspace is just fucking short as hell. And they still, like, let, you know, giant people on six foot, you know, six five in there. Mm. Kind of. Feel sorry for them, but yeah. Uh, current subs, yeah, uh, yeah, not bad, not bad, pretty decent. Some yeah. room to move around. Nice, nice. <laughs> anyway, room is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you're on there for fucking months at a time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, bring a big collection of movies and a big collection of porn, and trade with people. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so so I've heard, so I've heard. Hmm. Anyways, this day in history, the year 1977, the United States President Jimmy Carter pardons nearly all American Vietnam draft dodgers, uh, Vietnam War draft dodgers. Hmm. So this one's actually kind of fucking cool. Uh, yeah, boy, oh boy, so... You know, during the campaign to get into the presidency, uh, Ford was trying to campaign and saying that, you know, he would kind of, you know, do a little this or that and maybe pardon some of the people. But Jimmy Carter, you know, he ran on a platform of saying that he would fucking 
pardon him and on his first day in as president uh, uh, carter issued executive order 11967 which pardoned vietnam era draft evaders whether or not they had been convicted and you know whether or not they ran to, to canada so almost every single one of them were pardoned which is pretty fucking cool uh, yeah so well, especially uh, the, coming from a veteran uh himself yeah uh of the 1.857 million so almost 2 million people that were drafted between 64 and 73 uh over 200,000 were believed to have violated the selective service act though only 4% of those were actually convicted so uh at least 30,000 people were believed to have fled the country and most of those to canada <laughs> man oh man so yeah but I mean, that's that's 8,400 people that were convicted. That, that's a lot, but out of, <laughs> you know, a couple hundred thousand, it's not, yeah. not that many. But, uh, shit, as I recall, I mean, he went to, didn't he go to West Point, Carter? Naval Academy. Okay, yeah. yeah. Annapolis graduate. Annapolis, okay, there you go. Uh, yeah, he graduated the United States uh, Naval Academy. Yeah, he, I mean, shit. <laughs> If anybody, you know, wasn't going to pardon him, you know, it'd be somebody that, you know, actually went through in one of the academies. Somebody who volunteered. Yeah. But then again, he was a Baptist preacher, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Although he shit, has severed his ties with the Baptist church. Has he? Yeah. How, how lovely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Two anti-woman and anti-gay. Oh. Anti-human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anti-half the world plus. <laughs> oh, shit. Fucking Baptist. Yeah, Carter's a fucking <laughs> awesome guy. Oh, yeah. Anyways, that, he doesn't deserve all the trash talking people give him. That's for sure. All right. Anyways, it is, yes. It's time for another quick break and then history. And I'm going to switch the video. Uh, for those of you uh, listening, uh, we are actually recording a video that's going up on YouTube this time. Oh, no. And it's using some software I'm playing around with. If this goes well, uh, we will be doing live streaming through the software. And one cool thing I can do is switch away from our faces for the breaks. <laughs> we love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Tweet us at atheistnomads. Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. And for science and technology, we have a theme today. <laughs> Actually, it's all prompted by... Two bad articles I saw. One was a reprinting of part of another. And this is on the Cascadia subduction zone. So during the evening of January 16, the water column, as measured by an ocean buoy off the shore from Astoria, Oregon, in the Cascadia subduction zone, dropped four feet in a matter of four hours. This, well, the buoy also had an alert. This caught the attention of Superstation 95, that's 95.1 FM in New York, New York, who declared a U.S. West Coast earthquake warning and reprinted a bunch of a New York Times article from the summer about how bad the Cascadia earthquake will be when it happens. Mm. And they claimed in this that it was far enough away from the shore to not be affected by tides, and their explanation was that it was the Juan de Fuca plate dropping four feet beneath the North American plate. In addition to saying that it could cause a large earthquake, they also um, described that subduction as fueling a tunnel that goes straight to Mount Hood. So it could also prompt a volcanic eruption. Right. Nice. So there's definitely some science there. Um, 
And, you know, that much of a rapid subduction could be a sign of a larger earthquake. Uh, but when I see doomsday reporting like that, <laughs> especially coming from a radio station in New York, um, I, I thought I needed to check for a more credible source, such as, you know, something that's actually describing the science a little I'll better. Be honest, I didn't feel or hear anything locally. And if it was the big one, you would. Yeah, probably so. Yeah. So there was an earthquake recently in the subduction zone. And this was off of the uh, northeast of Vancouver, BC on December 29. But it was only a magnitude 4.8. And it was actually under a part of the subduct that subducted portion of the Juan de Fuca plate. But more interesting than that, there is a slow earthquake that started December 21st along the border between the plates. It started on the north end of the fault and has been making its way south. There was a notable slow earthquake in 2010 uh, that was a magnitude 6.8, the same as the Nisqually quake of 2001, but it lasted from August 8 to September 8, a full month. Sweet. A full month of tiny little shaking spread out over the 700-mile fault. And yeah, the total energy released was a 6.8, but nobody could feel it. Nope. It's only detectable with instruments, and these slow earthquakes happen every 12 to 15 months. Now, this is in contrast with similar subduction zones along the Ring of Fire, such as the ones off the shores of Japan and Chile, which produce also produce magnitude 9-plus earthquakes. But they have smaller earthquakes going almost all the time. I've heard recently that in Chile, people can tell you how strong an earthquake was on the Richter scale off of feel. <laughs> they have them that commonly. Now, unfortunately, it is true that we are already overdue for a major Cascadia earthquake. Most likely, it will be in the 8.5 to 9.0 range. There is the possibility that it could be about one-tenth the likelihood of it being in the 8.5 to 9 range is that it would be in the 9 to 9.5 range. And per a recent FEMA report, when this happens... Uh, an estimated 13,000 people will die. Most of the roads, bridges, and buildings in the affected regions will be destroyed or too expensive to repair. And then there's the tsunami, a 700-mile-long wall of water up to 100 feet high that will, within 15 minutes, wash many coastal towns out to sea, flood quite a few inland areas, probably not to I-5, like this article from Superstation 95 reported. Uh, but it will then also devastate Japan 10 hours later <laughs> when the same wall of water hits there. It's happened before. Last time was in 1701, and it will happen again. Now, let's get back to that water column drop that started this initial reporting. Well, I, I would like to... Toss in a, a quick couple things. Oh, okay. Uh, Japan, yeah. Uh, that country, I mean, they have, like, mountains inland, but their entire coast is, like, flat. So, yeah, if any water comes up, the entire, like, edge of the country is getting washed away. It's kind of sad. But, Whereas uh, um, northwestern U.S., it's, there's the coast range. Right, we have two two mountain ranges, and, yeah, so... Between Washington State and Canada, water will like go around the top of the mountains and you know kind of echo off between the two mountain ranges. And yeah, Bremerton will probably be mostly washed away. Uh, Ooh, so or at least at least get some some damage. So you might survive. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, you know, if I have any warning, you know, I can get you know four or five hundred feet really quick. And that is one nice thing with the 
the entire Puget Sound region is it's so hilly. Yeah. You can get above where the water will be quickly on foot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even in like 10 minutes walking, I, I could get a couple hundred feet easy. And being that far from the fault up there, uh, you'd have about a 20 minute warning. Maybe longer. Maybe. Since it would have to travel back down around the the sound. That's a good thing about living about living around the shipyard. You know, I can hear all the alerts. You know, it's kind of a pain in the ass, especially on like Saturday mornings. <laughs> no, but uh, I'm trying to sleep. But yeah, um, I, I I would definitely hear notices. So that's good. Yeah, but one thing that, that they were talking about in on the Superstation ninety five article is that <laughs> Japan has amazing early warning systems. Yeah. The U S doesn't. That's true. When that happens, the only warning that a giant wall of water is coming will be the shaking. Well, like the coastal towns uh, on the edge of the, of the Pacific ocean, they do actually have like tsunami warning sirens, but a few that, in the towns, yeah. Yeah. And that's really not going to be enough warning time. It's not, and it's not the quality of, of early warning as, as Japan has, but also... But Japan's getting like 10 hours. There's... Well, I mean, for, for when they have earthquakes in Japan. Oh, okay. Uh, but if you're on the coast and that happens, there is a mountain range right next to you. There is nowhere to go. No, yeah, it's pretty. <laughs> you have roads into those <laughs> coastal towns, and then you have long roads back to the highways. And yeah, the mountains are just completely undeveloped for the most part. Mm hmm. So, so that water is going to wash their asses up. Better fucking hike. And quickly. <laughs> <laughs> if you can get to hills nearby and get up quickly, you'll be fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be on the beach when that hits. <laughs> <laughs> and what one thing they, they do bring up that is a, a good point is, you know, the, the, the Cascadia Fault wasn't even a known thing until a few decades ago. And it's one of the worst in the world. But people have built up a civilization. They didn't even have earthquake codes like in Oregon until... 1994. <laughs> and so most of the structures, older structures can't handle that kind of shaking because it's the perfect storm of major earthquakes and then centuries of quiet. Those slow quakes that release the little bits of energy that periodically anywhere else, those would be magnitude six and seven earthquakes. Chile and Japan get six and sevens all the time. It's just a part of life. It's the nines that really fuck things up. Japan's building codes are, are like amazing. Most of their buildings aren't even allowed to stand for more than you know, 10, 20 years at most, and they have to get special permits. After that, they have Holy to be crap. Re re rebuilt to new specs, to new, you know, to new tolerances for earthquakes and whatever else oh, that's crazy <laughs> so yeah in general like major buildings just don't stick around that long unless they get like special permits and we don't even do that with bridges or the columbia river dams uh. <laughs> which are t crumbling many of those bridges and the dams are crumbling because the u.s doesn't invest in infrastructure this can be very expensive to do so when it crumbles, like dis dissolves. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so let's get back to this this water column drop. Uh, there was the Oregonian and uh, KGW in Portland both uh, critiqued this original article. And their main point was it's the tide. I looked at the original, the actual NOAA graph from the NOAA website, 
that covers the entire day. I've downloaded it and we'll put it in with the show notes on the website at atheistnomads.com slash 130. The water levels actually dropped for about six hours, not the four he was talking about. Then it rose for about six hours. Then it fell again for about six hours. Most of those risings and fallings were about six feet. He was only looking at one with four feet. So, yeah, that wasn't subduction. It was the fucking tide. <laughs> That's awesome. God damn. All right, it's time. Oh, you. Oh, I'm just looking at a picture of the Cascadia subduction zone. Yeah. And, and there's like the Pacific plate, which butts up against the Juan de Fuca plate, which butts up against the North American plate. You know, mm-hmm. it, there's a lot of room for all that stuff to just float around <clears throat> and yeah you could have some major earthquakes out in the ocean we would basically like you said never fill it well the pacific plate is pushing the Juan de Fuca plate 3.9 centimeters a year uh, as I understand it they're, they're going apart no those two are that is an act of subduction uh, Juan de Fuca and pacific plate might be pulling apart yeah, sorry, sorry. Pacific yeah. Juan de Fuca pulling apart. Juan, Juan de Fuca, Fuca is, is going under the North American. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Which fuels the volcanoes and uh, every two to four hundred years causes a 8.5 to 9.5 earthquake that's 700 miles long. <laughs> well, we got, uh, <laughs> we got Mount St. Helens to blow. I guess it's Rainier or Hood's time. They're both overdue. There's a lot of them. They're not overdue, but there's a lot of them that haven't erupted in a while and still have their tops. Yeah. So let's take another quick break, and then we'll be back with politics and religion. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine at Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. Pakistani lawmakers had introduced a bill that would have raised the minimum age for marriage to 18 from the current 16 and Mm. increased the penalties for arranging child marriages, something that is currently pretty common with adult men marrying young girls, despite the current minimum age of 16. So, you know, higher penalties would be good. Um, Raising the minimum age for marriage to 18, that seems like a pretty good thing to do. Unfortunately, the dicks off if they want to marry a young girl. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the uh, Council of Islamic Ideology thinks differently, and they are a constitutional body within Pakistan that exists to advise Parliament on whether or not laws are compatible with Sharia. They ruled that this new law was un-Islamic, and the bill was pulled. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm still with the whole chopping off thing. Are you still there? Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> I'm still thinking about the whole chopping off thing. You know, get one of those little like cigar choppers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, stick the tip in, and we'll see if you still want to marry a a nine year old, ah. or, or even a sixteen year old at that. Hey, if it was good enough for Muhammad. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! God damn. <laughs> Ah, uh, meanwhile, in Pakistan, mm-hmm. a 15 year old boy was attending a meeting at the village mosque when the imam told them that those who love the prophet Muhammad always say their prayers. He then asked if anybody had stopped praying. The boy misunderstood the question and he raised his hand. The crowd then accused him of blasphemy. So he ran home 
chopped off the hand he had raised and presented it to the imam. All with the praise plate. of on a plate, yeah. And his parents and the once angry mob all praised him. Motherfuckers. And yeah. I'm sorry, but stupid kid. I, I don't care. I, I don't see any good angle in this. I mean, no, this, this is not a virtue. Angry mob in Pakistan says blasphemy. I guess that's better than, you know, they could have killed him getting killed. I suppose they probably would have killed him. And then one of the, the people who killed him probably would have just gotten a couple lashes. If anything, this is religion is at its most despicable when it gets people. Well, actually no, what religion does that is despicable is getting people to do idiotic, harmful things to themselves because they think it's they did something wrong when all it was was a mistake. God fucking damn. <laughs> oh, shit. You know... <laughs> Yeah, you know, I I remember this. There's a story about my dad sleeping in, in church and the pastor calling him out on it. And uh, the pastor's like, "Isn't that right, brother Jim?" And you know, my dad like uh, wakes up real quick and stands up and says, "Uh, John three, sixteen." And stands back down, sits back down, uh, which has nothing to do with the, what the fuck the pastor was talking about. But it's like this <laughs> little kid; he he got called out. And, just wasn't fucking paying attention and yeah um i'd rather take an embarrassment over a, a hand please thank you yeah yeah holy shit you know everybody just has a fucking laugh and you know you keep on going what the fuck yeah man dusty hit infant is petitioning to have the Lindale Public Elementary School in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Stop. <laughs> Which part of that are you laughing at? Moose Jaw? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, she's trying to get them to stop their practice of playing the Lord's Prayer over the PA system each morning. She started last year with the principal, then moved to the school board, then to the provincial government. The school brushed her off, saying kids can leave the room if they object, and that 90% of the parents are in favor of it. The board voted 6-3 to three to keep the prayers, saying that they are following the law, and the provincial government said the local school divisions are autonomous in these matters. Mm. It's not illegal. So they can do what they want. The head of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission, David Arnott, actually agrees with her, but all he can do is issue recommendations. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have any power. Uh, fortunately, she has gotten the attention of the CBC, that's the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and doesn't seem to be ready to give up the fight. Good for her. <clears throat> well, government and religion, especially uh, schools and religion, are tied together quite a lot tighter up in Canada. Oh yeah. Uh, so, there's been, we've covered stories before in Alberta where the only school option and it is publicly supported is the Catholic school. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. But, that would, that would, yeah. Suck. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just saying, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I totally feel sorry for you. And, you know, Dusty, you can bring your kid down here to the great U.S. and have him get a second-rate education, but without the prayer, you know, you could do that. Just just thought. <laughs> or move to Europe, better yet. You know, good schools there. Yeah. Besides, besides I'm going to name drop with Carl Mamer. Uh, talking with him yesterday, he said that... Uh, Canadian dollar is like just down a shithole right now. 
Ooh. Uh, mostly because we have cheap oil right now, so they have shitty mm. dollar. So. Uh, the peso has also been down. Really? In the week I was in Mexico last month, uh, mm -hmm. the value of the peso dropped roughly one peso per dollar. Wow. When we got there, it was averaging out at about 16.4 to 1. By the time we left, it was p starting to get to 17.5 to 1. Oh. <laughs> I felt like an idiot every time I, I got money out of the ATM knowing that it'd be worth less within <laughs> as soon as I took it out. <laughs> Oh, fuck. Yeah. Man, oh man. <clears throat> yeah, well. Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> Just have yeah. a good fucking time and drink, drink you know, <laughs> cheap cerveza on the beach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, and moving closer to home, especially for me, Kenneth Medenbach was arrested last Friday for felony unauthorized use of a motor vehicle for driving a stolen and rebranded Fish and Wildlife Service vehicle. <laughs> this was the first, and up to the date of recording, the only arrest for any of the militants occupying the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. A.K.A. those assholes down in Oregon. Yeah, the rebels stealing our land. Traders. That we rightfully stole from the native tribe, who is also pissed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe not rightfully stole, but the the Paiute tribe is more pissed than anybody else about this wildlife refuge being stolen. Rightfully stole? No, just outright stole. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maddenbach <laughs> already has a history of convictions for driving documentation lying to officers, squatting on federal land, in other words, illegal camping, just staying more than 15 to 21 days, depending on the forest. And he was released awaiting trial for, again, squatting on federal land on the condition that he wouldn't occupy any federal property. <laughs> so he's sitting in jail now in in Bend, or yeah, Bend, uh, Oregon State Police um, took him the 120 or so miles from Burns to Bend, cross county lines, just to make sure that I guess get him further away, yeah. somewhere they could actually handle him. And somewhere yeah, he's gonna where have the to, militia wouldn't come after him. Yeah, get him out, possibly. And they're gonna have to uh, send him back down to Medford for his federal trial, <laughs> which will add. Hopefully they'll add some charges for that. But this has been going on for more than two weeks now. We're pushing three weeks. By the date of recording, it'll be three weeks, and they haven't done anything. This is absolutely ridiculous. Well, you know, they finally sent somebody out for snacks, and you know they, they snagged them, so I'm happy about that. They didn't even go into the Safeway to get the other guy that was there. They just took the car that he'd driven. Uh, the van he'd driven. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, other guy gets a nice long walk back. Uh, but, you know, yeah, they, they get him on, you know, theft of a federal vehicle, among other things. So at least it's chuckle worthy. But uh, the least they could do is set up a blockade. Yeah, well, fucking turn out the power turn off the water, starve them out. Starve them out, freeze them out. Yeah. It would end quickly. Yeah. This shit would, yeah. Those those fucking wussies out there, yeah, this should be over by now. Mm-hmm. But instead, Ammon Bundy is just going to get more and more emboldened by federal inaction. Well, it's not like the fucking federal government did anything to his dad. Fucking Cliven got away with, you know, keeping his his uh, cattle out on federal lands for uh -huh. decades. With still owes millions of dollars. He's still doing it, and he's still not paying. Yeah. Regardless I, I, of, I think it's time for everybody to go out to fucking 
Clive and Bundy's ranch, pick a cow and start cutting off your own, you know, cuts, whatever you want. <laughs> Free steaks for everybody. <laughs> I'm down. Let's do this. Shit. Cause he's stealing from us, the American people. Exactly. All of let's, us. Yeah. Let's, let's go get a fucking, you know, prime cut out of his cows. Now for our foreign listeners, he's not stealing from you, but, but he's you're still, still a motherfucker. I, I, me and me as an American, I give you, I give you permission. You can go down to Bundy's ranch and pick a cow. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a, a decent number of vegetarians in the U.S. You can have their pieces. God damn right I will. Oh, <laughs> cow. And for our final story, two city council members in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, boycotted a secular invocation. <laughs> One skipped the invocation entirely. The other walked out partway through since it offended his deeply held belief that the U.S. is founded on Christian principles. Then, 30 seconds early, the mayor cut off Alita Ledendecker from the Rationalists of East Tennessee, claiming that she'd gone over the allotted time. Complete bullshit. Yeah, this is bullshit. Yeah, uh, they cut her off at 2.30. She had three minutes. Plus... People, just, you know, council members just being fucking rude and, you know, not being there. Yeah. Just fucking assholes. Oh, and to, to make matters worse, the rationalists of East Tennessee had been trying to get this spot for a long time. They finally got put on the schedule, but they weren't notified. Oh, <laughs> Nice. They happened to find out at the last minute and got someone there. Fortunately, uh, Ledenbecker has been officiating, or not officiating, but giving invocations at other city and, counts and county meetings around East Tennessee. So she was ready. Oh, badass. But God damn. That's, this is, this is bad form. Trina Bow and Rick Chin Jr., you guys are assholes, both of you. Yeah. Oh, what the hell? Definitely. <laughs> Stupid shit. Oh, well. <clears throat> All right. It's time for feedback. All right. And we've got a message from at JCC Ford via Twitter. That's Jason Ford. At Atheist Nomads, will we ever be able to stop telling people that GMOs aren't bad for you? No. I swear I keep having the same conversations. You're gonna. Yeah. Forever. <clears throat> if. Ba basically, um, here's something I heard on <laughs> oh, the Skeptics Guide to the Universe recently. Uh, basically, there's this really bad fungus or something that's going through uh, non-GMO oranges and yeah. it's basically turned them into shit, like green orange or something like that. Yep. And uh, yeah, basically, there's going to come a time when the only oranges you're going to get are fucking GMO oranges. And you know what? There's going to be a lot of people that want their fucking orange juice and like fucking, mm -hmm. you know what? All right. I'm going to have some fucking orange juice and, and you, you're just not going to have a organic option. Yeah. Well, so, same thing's going to happen to bananas when the current yeah. clone banana is gone. There's a decent chance its replacement will be GMO. Or will have to be GMO. And fucking, there's uh, only one species of banana. Fucking uh, American chestnuts. Those weren't even a thing for a long time until they brought them back in, in GMO form. Mm -hmm. you know, they're repopulating them across the U.S., I guess. But uh, yeah, those weren't, those weren't a thing for a long time because of a disease of some sort. Yeah. So now, if with you get these... an American chestnut, it's definitely a GMO. And remind people of that they'll, they'll probably flip their shit <laughs> yeah yeah with this type of fear it's a it's the same kind of fear as anti-vax and the anti-vax movement seems like something new it's not it dates back to the first vaccine the original vaccine for smallpox now, at the time that that was going around, it was a legitimate fear. 
the vaccine was taking pus from a cowpox infected cow, slicing open your arm and sticking some of the pus in it, then taking that and doing that with the next person. There were towns, entire towns, that contracted diseases like tuberculosis and herpes from somebody early in the chain having that disease and it being spread to everybody else. (laughs) So, no, vaccines, they weren't always safe. But then modern medicine and modern technology came around. They started freeze-drying the smallpox vaccine. They started using single-use needles. They quickly figured out in the 20th century how to do it safely and eradicated a fucking disease. But people were throughout that entire time afraid of the smallpox vaccine. There are people who are afraid of the flu vaccine because it might make you a little bit sick. There were people afraid of, well, still are people afraid of the the whooping cough vaccine because it might make you a little sick. Well, it's a lot less likely to since they weakened it to make it less likely to give you symptoms because people were afraid of a little bit of a fever and a little cough and apparently more afraid of that than cracked ribs <laughs> and death. Yeah, there you go. Ah, so, you know, are we ever going to be able to stop telling people GMOs are bad for you? No. It's never going to happen. I think there are a lot of people who would rather not eat oranges than eat GMO oranges if that's the only option. Yeah. I think people are going to just give up and say fuck it i want i want an orange what ends up happening with movements like that is there are the hardcore believers and then there's the people who follow the popular movement anti-vax is popular right now it's always been around but it's grown because well it spread through social media and was fueled by fucking andrew wakefield and Oprah and like yeah. the, the, the upper middle class. And the same thing will happen with, or a similar anti GMO will probably at some point when enough food is GMO will drop as more and more people realize, Oh yeah, this is safe. It's not going to turn me into a fish, <laughs> but there will always be the true believers. I even heard that uh, Cam- <clears throat> excuse me. I even heard that Campbell's soup is uh, they've they've always been pro GMO, but they're going to be uh, labeling self labeling mm-hmm. uh, that their products contain GMO, and uh, they're kind of taking the you know taking some of the the fight out of what the, the anti GMO people always say is that you know you must be afraid to label your food. Why don't you just label it? And Campbell's like, fuck it. All right, we're going to label it all. And, you know, that I think that's going to take a lot of the, the fire out of uh, anti-GMO's arguments. It, but on the, on the flip side, I would love yeah. to see organic come out with like, a, all right, we use uh, copper-based uh, pesticides. We, we, we use fucking radiation to mutate our vegetables to, to get the, uh, the desired traits that we want. All this weird shit. That- now, the, the whole point of labeling laws is to turn the public against it's GMO foods and eventually lead to banning it. Yeah. Campbell's may win the fight, but it's more likely they will lose, that this will backfire on them. I think they're too big. I, I think that uh, they're they're kind of too big to fail, kind of like you know the fucking banks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really, I, I think this is this is going to be a turning point where people are like, "Oh, all right, fucking Campbell's, yeah, all right." I, I, I hope some, you're right. I want, some, I want soup. Uh, I would love to see if if 
GMO labeling ever becomes a thing, I would love to see pesticide and other similar labeling also come along with it. Because I know I, for a number of years, thought that organic meant no pesticides. <laughs> yeah. No, it just means ugly fruit. Yeah. And, you know, uh, <clears throat> crops that need so much more land to to be able to uh, harvest anything useful. Mm -hmm. So much more land. Or way worse uh, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides. Yep. Oh, oh. Uh, Lauren's listening in now. <laughs> oh, hello. Hi, Lauren. We're almost done. Uh, it could be. Quickly. <laughs> Not yet. And it is now. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Hi Wesley. Hello. Yeah, <laughs> I've, been, I've been watching Mystery Science Theater. Oh, darn. Oh, poor me. <laughs> yeah, suffering with the uh, MST3K. Mm. And orange. And Lauren's on video now, too. Oh, hi. For those watching video. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll yeah, just hide behind the it. microphone. It's, it's still <laughs> swirling. All I see is me in the corner. Uh, uh, bummer. All you have to do is look at your ugly face the whole time? That's no, us. No, that shit's shrunk down. What are you talking about? I don't look at me. <laughs> All right. Well, if you want to contact us, you can always email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Call us at 541-203-0666 and leave us a message. Hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, or anywhere else. Just look for Atheist Nomads. And yes, don't and please, please donate. We need money. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to use our lovely little Amazon click-through on atheistnomads.com's website because, you know... It'll give us a, a little bit of scratch, and you won't notice a difference in price. But you know what? It, it everybody's got a birthday coming up, so uh, Valentine's Day, sir. Valentine's mm -hmm. Day. I don't know what you're talking about. Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for Lauren and I specifically, uh, I went through the budget on Saturday, and it was depressing. Hey, we're we're gonna do kind of like what you are. We're we're fucking PBR in it this Valentine's. The uh, podcast money is uh, what we'll be eating on, basically. Fuck. Uh, yeah. Fuck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, God, you guys are screwed. Uh, $700 a month in student loan payments. Oh, shit. Yay! Yeah. Yay. And those are almost all mine, and I can't get those deferred for Lauren being out of work. No. <sighs> but I can get mine, can't I? Yeah, but that's only fifty dollars a month. Yeah, well, but again, fifty dollars is fifty dollars when you're. 50 that's fifty dollars buys a fuckload of top ramen. That's fueling the cars. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Alrighty, well, thank you all for listening, and also thank you and special shout out to our YouTube viewers that are actually looking at us right now. And we will be back next week. With an interview. Mm. Outro. Outro. Thank you for if listening to another episode of Atheist this, Nomads. You can find show notes and contact yep. information at atheistnomads.com. This is um, at the end Follow of the show where Twitter, people pretend to talk to each other on, on like the news Facebook programs and stuff, but they're not actually talking to each other. Oh, yeah, that's always that Please kind of subscribe cool to the show in iTunes, and Stitcher, or your podcast of choice. And while you're there, you are talking over the review. The outro on our YouTube, Sturdy Fred. Oh, well, that's okay. They've all heard it before. It's the Atheist Nomads. His name's not Besides, really sturdy they've Fred. seen you now. They're not coming back. <laughs> His name's not really Sturdy Fred. Uh... And I'm going to stop everything now. So, bye.